as we've been looking at the toldot of Terah, which is the Hebrew word for generations, um, I'm placing that chart again in your notes, and I, I won't put it back uh, again, but I did want it to have it there for a few weeks so that you could continue to see that picture of who Terah is, who his family is, because this is the beginning of the Hebrew nation. And we will see, building on this, we will see who these people are as we move through Genesis. So it's important to understand the dynamics of this chart. Terah had three sons. Abraham married Sarah, or Sarai at that time, his half-sister, which was uh, through Terah with another wife. And his brother was Nahor, and his brother Haran died. Lot then became a, a nephew that was under his tutelage, so to speak. So we need to understand those relationships. And uh, as we go through this book, they will get developed even further. Uh, the text that we looked at for the last couple of weeks that the Jews call Lech Lecha, which means get you, or get you out of here. It uh, pushed Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. And we saw that in the maps from the previous weeks where Ur of the Chaldees was down near Babylon. It's a very sinful place. And God came to him and commanded him to leave, and Abraham responded. And there are several insights that we brought up last week that I wanted to just touch on this week. God is in absolute control of everything in this world. Regardless of whether we understand it or not, God controls everything. The Bible demonstrates his will in at least two ways. His creative or causative will, where he initiates things and makes it happen, such as creation, the making of men, the making of plant and animal life, directing people's ways, electing people, electing groups of people for his purposes. And he also has a permissive will, which is he allows things to happen. And we don't understand the inner workings of those two methodologies that he employs. We just know that he does both things. He allows things to happen. He allowed sin to come in the world. He didn't stop it. He allows the chaos that's here today. Just look at the news and look at all the uprisings that are happening all around this world. It's getting worse. They're all around the globe now. Things go from organized to disorganized. The engineering and the physics community call that entropy. When sin came in, things got disorganized and they continue to go so, go so. But no one can alter God's purposes. What he has planned, he will accomplish. So says Isaiah in Isaiah 46, 11. He's going to conform everything to his will someday. And it's important for us to understand that because he said, Surely as I have planned, so it will be. As I have purposed, so will it stand. And that also, that sovereignty of God also goes to his sustaining our lives, sustaining the proper chemical components of our bodies, the chemical nature of the gaseous cloud around this earth, keeping a perfect pressure that stays within a very narrow range of about 14.7 pounds per square inch, a perfect level of oxygen for us to take in, and he keeps everything moving. There isn't an invisible hand, there isn't some magical force, some evolutionary uh, um, propelling, if you will. It is God that creates controls and sustains. Why he allows sin, I don't understand, but he does. His permissive will allows things to happen that are outside of his will, but he uses them for the greater good to achieve his promises. He sustains all creatures. He gives life 
He takes life away as he chooses and when he chooses. All things were created for the glory of God and all things exist for him. So say the 24 elders in the throne room of God that we see in Revelation 4, casting down their crowns on that glassy sea and praising God the Father for what he has done and him being in control and wanting the glory. Our role on this earth is singular in purpose and that is to glorify God. There is no other purpose. We are to glorify God. Now there are a lot of things that he has us do but under, they are all underneath giving him the glory that he wants. And that is our sole purpose here. Now, the second observation that we saw last week is that when Abram went down to Egypt, he was violating God's commandment. God told him to go to Canaan. He did not tell him to go to Egypt. Regardless of the circumstances in Canaan, there was a famine there. He wasn't told to go down to Egypt. He took it on his own and he went down there. His faith wasn't mature at that point in time. And the Bible tells us in other areas that going down to Egypt is representative of taking things into our own hands. And it will always cause problems when we try and manage our own circumstances outside of the will of God. And we're going to see this in Abram's life in a number of different ways and times. He sins, he's outside of God's will, but God continues to give him the promises that he made. Third, going down to Egypt is a typical biblical illustration for following yourself instead of following God. Following yourself instead of following God. Now we just saw that it's gonna result in problems and if you follow yourself, your own desires, instead what God is leading you to do, based on a rock-solid understanding of Scripture, you're going to have problems. Abram's faith was seriously tried in this situation. I can only imagine what it was like to be in a famine. We've never had famine here in the United States, at least not for most of the population. We've had people go hungry from time to time, to be sure. But we haven't had a massive famine. Not like they've had in the Middle East. And they've had a lot of them in the Middle East and in Africa. And I'm sure in other spots of the world. This uh, descent, if you will, that Abram made going down into um, Egypt, it foreshadows a biblical prophecy that his progeny would be there for over 400 years. And then they would come out in the Exodus. Now we can look at this as leaving the high peak of the promises that he got in Canaan and descending into the sin in Egypt. Went from the highest point of these promises of the Abrahamic covenant to going into active, purposeful sin, violating God's commandment. God gives us his best and we turn away from him and we do what we want now, Sarah was about 65 years old at the time they went down there. And the Bible says that she was very beautiful. It's probable that God, knowing he was going to bring a child through her in her later years, um, slowed down the aging process for her. Somehow, she was still extremely attractive at age 65. Um, when they went down there, Abram was, a, was fearful of losing his life because he knew that the Egyptians had a practice of abducting women and taking them away from their husbands, killing the husband and taking them for themselves. And uh, the archaeological archives affirm this, and we looked at one of those last week. So Abram's initial lack of faith, violating God's command, leads him into further sins by he's trying to preserve himself now. He believes that the Egyptians are going to kill him. So he lies to them and he asks Sarai to lie for him as well. He knew that the Egyptians would negotiate for her with a near relative, but it was a husband, they just kill a husband. 
So he assumes the role, he makes a half lie, if you will, and he tells the Egyptians, she's my sister. Now, sort of she was, because she was his half-sister. They had the same father, but different mothers. And then he had married her. So the closer relationship and the truth of it was, she was his wife. So he knew that if she lied for him, he could get away and they would take her. Here's another sin. Abandoning his wife to preserve himself. And he knew that she would be in some sort of a marriage relationship with the Egyptians and he could get out of there and maybe even get some money for it. Because he said, it would be well for me if you do this lying so I can get out of here. It just further complicates the situation as lies always do. You step outside of the faith and the trust that you have in God and the specific commandments that he had and you, now you start lying and one lie leads to another lie. It always does when you're trying to live the lie. The situation that Abram feared the most started to happen. They see the common Egyptians saw how beautiful she was and they go tell the royal governors. They then in turn tell Pharaoh how beautiful this woman is and he says, well, I want her, you know. Now, there was no need for Pharaoh to bargain with anybody. He could take anything he wanted. He was the supreme authority in the land and had complete control over everything that happened in Egypt. Now, Pharaoh did try and pay for her, though, because there is an ancient code there. He didn't have to do this, but there is an ancient code that stated if the father was dead, then the brother could negotiate for an available woman. And because uh, the brother would be the legal guardian. So Pharaoh deals well with Abram and he takes her into his harem. And the resulting problem came upon them is that there were plagues in that harem. Now the Bereshit Rabbah says that the plague was either leprosy or a skin condition. We don't know exactly what it is because it's not defined here. Um, and the Jews in the Bereshit Rabbah, which is a second century Jewish midrash or commentary, they, they make this case because they say it would make sexual intercourse with Sarai very undesirable and that would preserve her purity for bringing forth this promised child who would be Isaac as yet future to this time. Now, Pharaoh, you can look at Pharaoh and say, well, he's kind of an innocent guy here. He really doesn't seem to be doing anything really bad. But God had a covenant. And when God makes a covenant, he fulfills it. He does everything that he says he's going to do. Whether we understand that or believe it or not, he will do everything that he says he will do. It's unconditional and he intervenes to preserve that covenant. Once the plague happens and Pharaoh says, oh, it's, it's Sarah, he, he, he realizes what it is. Now whether he had a divine intervention in a dream, like what happened to Abimelech the next time Abram does this, we'll see in Genesis 20, or whether he just sees that she came in, the plagues come, that must be it. Let's get, get rid of her, get rid of her. So he says, get rid of her. I don't want her here. Um, he knows what's going on and he goes to Abram, he says, what is this that you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? So I took her to be my wife. So he kicks them both out. Get out of here. I get out of here. He wants to get rid of that plague. Now normally they would have been executed for doing something so heinous to the Pharaoh. But uh, the Pharaoh sensed some divine protection here and did not want to be even part of this. Just get rid of them. And the result is, with a royal escort and a lot of gifts, Abram leaves Egypt to go back to Canaan. He's given sheep, oxen, female donkeys, male donkeys, men servants, maid servants, and camels. Somehow within that, he's able to make some trades for some gold and silver too. I don't know exactly how he got the gold and silver, but he came out of there with gold and silver as well. 
I think the point of this that we need to recognize is that one, God is in control. He's going to get done what he said he's going to get done. And that prosperity is not guaranteed to the children of God for adherence to God's laws and proper behavior. God has promised that we will have enough. He never promised that we'd be wealthy at all. He has raised some people up and he's put some people down at his will. Here, Abraham gets all this stuff through subterfuge and God continues to bless him. Because he promised to bless him. That's why he did it. He doesn't go back on his word. It's his sovereign choice as to who he's going to bless materially and how he's going to do it. He promised to bless Abraham through this covenant that he made with him and God fulfilled his promise. Hagar, the Egyptian that will in the future yet will bear his first child was probably acquired at this time as one of the maidservants. And it's interesting is by trying to give his wife Sarah away, he acquires Hagar who would later become his slave wife. It's an interesting play on words in the Hebrew language, how that works out. <clears throat> and he does so at Sarai's insistence. He didn't go to Hagar himself and she didn't come to him. This was Sarai that did this. It was her failure when she doubted God's promises. Pharaoh was cursed for cursing Abram and Abram was blessed regardless of the wrong activities that he engaged in. And this is sort of a, a type, if you will, or a model or an illustration or example of the nation Israel. They sin, but overall they're blessed. Yes, God turns away from them and he corrects them, but he has never, ever stopped loving them. The covenant that he promised would be a blessing to them and it's unconditional. As we move into the next section of scripture, we're going to see that Abrahamic covenant being operative. We're going to see God doing exactly what he said he was going to do, regardless of the behavior of the individuals. And we're going to see an interesting relationship this morning between Lot, God, and Abram. And we're going to see personalities, and we're going to see ideas and attitudes that get acted out even today. You can see these things in people today. The text for today is Genesis 13 verses 1 to 18, which is essentially the entire chapter. Now Abram is leaving Egypt and going to Canaan. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, unto the place of the altar which he had made here at the first. And there Abram called on the name of Jehovah. And Lot also who went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before Jehovah destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of Jehovah, like the land of Egypt, as thou goest unto Zohar. So Lot chose him, all the plain of the Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners against Jehovah exceedingly. And Jehovah said unto Abram, 
After that, Lot was separated from him. Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. <clears throat> and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then may thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land, in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, and unto thee will I give it. And Abram removed his tent, and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built there an altar unto Jehovah. And I was reading from the American Standard Version of 1901. Now, during that time, the um, most influential pharaoh uh, of that time era of the Middle Kingdom was in control, and it was a dynasty 11 of Thebes. It lasted, actually, for about 143 years, and the most powerful ruler during that dynasty was uh, Mentuhopta II, and he ruled for 51 years from 1962 to 1911 B.C., and that was the time that Abram was in Egypt. The text says that Abram and his entourage went up out of Egypt. And actually what it means is it went north and then into the south of Israel. He left Thebes, which was the ancient capital, where Pharaoh's court was. And he went through the Negev, or the desert, which is also known as the wilderness. And uh, he moved into Canaan. Now the map that I've put there shows, uh, I've got an arrow pointing to where Thebes is, and he went in one of the two northern routes there, the way to Shur or the Great Trunk Road. Not really clear exactly where he went, but he did leave Thebes, and he did go up to Hebron, which is just north of uh, Beersheba. Beersheba is essentially the southern boundary of Israel. There's a, a saying with the Jews when they're talking about the entirety of the land from Dan to Beersheba, from Dan to Beersheba, and those are the southern and uh, northern boundaries. Now, prior to this, the writer of Genesis, and we know that Moses was the compiler, but there were many different writers. Now, that writer says that now that Lot came out with him, but prior to that, it didn't tell us that Lot went down into Egypt with them. But we know it from here. And uh, this story emphasizes Abram's wealth. And it, the first time actually that wealth is mentioned in the Bible. And he began to experience this material wealth that was promised to him in the beginning statements of the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12.3. Most of the gold, silver, and so on was gotten through um, Pharaoh when he expelled Abram. We, we, even though it wasn't listed, we think that Pharaoh either gave him the gold and silver or he negotiated and bartered for it. So he left the Negev and then he moved even more north to Bethel, which is a very productive farmland in the hill country. And there was great spiritual significance for Abram there because that was where he first built an altar and worshipped God when he came out of Haran, going south down into Canaan in obedience now the text says that he called on the name of Jehovah and this was a restoring time for Abram realizing his sin seeing God's divine providence to bring him out of that situation and he was thankful so he builds an altar there and he did some heinous things just absolutely heinous things disavowing his wife trying to get rid of her basically to preserve himself and in disobedience going down to Egypt. This follows, or this is followed by some strife that he entered into with Lot. And it's interesting that we pay attention to the dynamics of this strife because it's important. We'll see this today. We will see this today. This shows us the deep faith that Abram had. It, even though Abram sinned, as all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God, he still had God living within him. 
It provided him with that blessed assurance, that comfort that nothing else can give you. The blessed assurance, the comfort, the sealing that we get when God enters us and we allow him to take control. He knew God and he knew that God was in him and he had that assurance. And the conflict that we're going to look at here is one between that internal assurance and that satisfaction when the Spirit enters us, we get joy. Not happiness, we get joy, which is a deep-seated security that can only be given by God, whereas Lot was externally driven. He was driven by the material, and Abram, while he sinned, he was still driven by the spiritual. The spiritual comfort of Abram juxtaposed the material, physical motivators of Lot are what this section of scripture teaches us. Abram learned that he needed to follow God's plan and not be driven by his own desires. We also are comforted in that we are not to walk by sight, but by faith of what God is going to do. God has promised us immortality, and we have to take that at face value. We have to know that. And his blessed assurance allows us to see that and allows us to understand that the material is gone when we leave. All the material thing, everything we see in this room is going to go away when we leave these bodies. It doesn't matter. The material needs to be here for us to use, but it is a far, of far lesser importance than our spiritual connection to God and eternity. It's going to pass away. All of these things are going to pass away. Je Jesus said this very, very well in John 12, 25. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. If you love it here, and if you love things more than you love the spiritual nature of our promises, you're a materialist. You live with material things. A materialist is not one that is just trying to collect things, you know. Um, you can't say, well, somebody's got 10 cars or 52 bracelets or whatever. Um, that's just an outworking, uh, an obvious manifestation of somebody that's into materialism. Materialism is a focus on the material to the exclusion of the spiritual. And the worst that gets is where people deny the spiritual nature at all and everything is material. That this is all we have. You know, they, these trees and the grass and the building and everything, that's all that there is. They can't see the immortality that we're promised. The immortality that we're promised. Lot also got blessed through the Abrahamic covenant. He had his own flocks, and he had his own herds, and he had his own tents. And because the tents were plural, that means that he probably had slaves and servants too. He wasn't quite as wealthy as Abraham, but he had a lot of stuff. Um, the problem that arose here is that there was just minimal arable land for both of them to sustain their flocks and herds and slaves. Um, there was little land that was not under the auspices of the Canaanites in the subgroup that is mentioned here, the Perizzites. So you got constricted land, you've got a lot of herds, slaves, cattle, and so on. There arose a competition between the herdsmen for a limited amount of space. And uh, this strife caused Abram and Lot to look at it and try and settle it in one way or another. Now Abraham took the initiative there and he says, look Lot, let's not have any strife between us. We see what's going on. Um, they were close relatives and he called them his brethren. He didn't want 
their respective employees to be arguing over a limited amount of land. So he makes a very unselfish offer to Lot. Now, Abram realized that his spiritual blessings and his physical blessings came from God. And he had that connection. He had that self-satisfaction of knowing God and that repose, that joy that comes from having that relationship with God and knowing him. So Abram says to Lot, <clears throat> basically, go ahead and choose. You know, you pick what you want. Isn't the whole land before you? And it's a rhetorical question. Yeah, it is. Of course it is. So Lot got first choice. Abram looked at this and thought, hey, just take whatever you want. Take whatever you want. Now, I've seen my family members do this in dividing up estates. When one dies, somebody will take the initiative or should say, here, you guys take what you want and I'll take what's left. You know, I, I don't want to create any problems. It's a good principle to look at. Abram realized that his promises come from God. Material as well. He didn't have to aggressively try and compete with Lot to keep more land or to best Lot, if you will. All good and perfect things come from God. James 1.17. Now, both of these guys had material wealth. Abram had the wealth, but he didn't let the wealth control him. Many people are controlled by things. That's all they think about. I've known people that are constantly talking about whatever material acquisition they just made, the material acquisition they were in the process of making, and what their future purchases were going to be. And that's the extent of their discussions. It's constantly talking about things and the material and no spirituality at all. But this didn't control Abram. Lot, on the other hand, had a much more possessive nature. The material was controlling him. And we look at this as Lot walking by sight, Abram walking by faith. And so he picked, Lot picked what was there based upon what he thought was the best of the best. It was self-seeking, it was self-gratifying, and he looked at this and saying, oh man, it's my opportunity to grab all I can. But we're going to see here uh, in next week and the week after that his choices were very short-lived. Um, it looks good on the surface in the very beginning, but all was not to be as it seemed. Abram, walking by faith, just said, go ahead, you know, choose whatever you want, you take it. And uh, he was unselfish because he knew that God had provided for him even in the dismal sin and experiences that he had down in Egypt. And he knew that it was not by his own plan that he would come into the possessions that were his. Or by jealously guarding what he thought was his. He didn't have to. One who believes that God has promised for him is not greedy, covetous, or anxious about things. God has promised to provide us, for us. He never said that he was going to make us wealthy. And some he has. Some he has not, but as a child of God, he has promised we will have what we need. And we need to remember that because it's easy in the culture that we live in to get aggressive about trying to accumulate more and more and more and more. So Lot, Lot looks over the plain of Jordan and saw that it was well watered, just like the Nile Delta. You see, God hadn't destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah yet, so it was a fertile land, limited in size because the Canaanites and the Perizzites had taken over most of it. You know, it's not now. It's, that's a very dry and arid place now, and it doesn't produce very much in terms of crops. So he took for himself, that is Lot, what he thought was the best of the best. You can see his materialism creeping in here. He separated from Abram and he journeyed to the east. 
So as the uh, text tells us, Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, right in the middle of the Canaanites. The most sinful group of people that the Bible has ever described. And he was there in their midst where Lot moved his tents to the cities of the plain and moved his tents as far as Sodom. So while he was still living in a tent, it's pretty clear that he had moved all the way into the city of Sodom, but he was real close to it. He was living on the edge, as it were, living on the edge of Sodom. Now the Bible tells us that the men of Sodom were wicked. And it's interesting, the Hebrew word for wickedness even sounds wicked. It's rasha, rasha. And it's got a guttural sound to it. And it means exceedingly outwardly wicked. And uh, they were outside of Jehovah's will. And we can compare this to the same type of human behavior that was here before the flood. The same type of words are used to describe the same type of men that were on this earth violating God's rules, his commandments, and not even caring about God. And they received the penalty of God's judgment through that flood. Here, we're going to see in subsequent messages that they're going to receive fire and brimstone that came down from heaven and it uh, obliterated those two cities. God will not allow extreme wickedness to happen on his earth for any long period of time. Now, <clears throat> in our time, we're moving into an era where wickedness is increasing constantly. We can see it all around the world. It's getting increasingly worse. And there will be a point in time when God says he's had enough. He will remove his children, the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, <clears throat> and um, all hell will break loose, so to speak. And that's a literal statement. One of the reasons for the great tribulation that's coming on this earth is to make an end of sin from Daniel 9.24. The other two reasons are to bring the Jewish people in to a saving grace relationship with the Messiah. And in fact, when they finally call out to him, that's when he comes back at the end of the Great Tribulation. And the third reason is to conduct the largest evangelistic campaign that's ever happened in this world. But the prime reason is to eliminate sin. And God will destroy as he's destroyed before. And we're going to see this in the next couple of weeks, how he did it to Sodom. We're going to look at the steps that he worked within Sodom for his divine destructions. Now, this is the first step into Lot's sin. And we can look at it, and we can categorize it, and see those steps. And it's good for us to think through this, because we are warned by James in the New Testament exactly the same way about what happened to Lot. James 1 verses 12 to 16 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Do not err. And I just want you to look at the five steps that Lot is taking. Now we haven't, we haven't seen it in the scripture what the last two of these are. <clears throat> but he looks towards Sodom. There was materialistic lust there. He was enticed in that he chose the area of Sodom. Then he pitched his tent in Sodom. He moved closer to it. He just got a little closer to it. And you see somebody that's descending into sin. Well, I'll just, I'll just kind of get close, you know. I, I, I won't do it, but I'll just, I'll just 
be in the same room with those activities. Then he finally, as we will see in subsequent messages, he moved into Sodom, means he entered into the sin, at a place where exceedingly wicked people, the Rasha, were there. And then finally, we're going to see that he sat at the gate of Sodom, which means full citizenship and a town elder. He goes into the sinful place, and he just embraces the whole process and says, well, let me be one of your leaders. He's acting just like them. So, as James says, sin is fully developed to the point of death. <clears throat> and he will lose some family members as a result of this that we'll see in subsequent lessons. Amen? Let's pray.